was amazing and all that stuff, but really, mm -hmm. no stupid. Uh, in, uh, in 1968, Cherry uh, Rubin, who was the leader of what were called the Yippies, there was sort of a section of the anti-war movement in the States, and uh, Jack Kerouac uh, were both on, on a kind of a Saturday night chat show in the United States, watched by millions, tens of millions of people. And uh, Rubin being the Yippie was, you know, stoned and happy and kind of, Telling Kerouac how much he loved him and he loved you and you're a great guy and all this kind of thing. And it's, Kerouac was more kind of old style, he was drunk and cranky, you know, <laughs> uh, which was still a thing then, you know, we don't have it anymore because Arts have got so business like uh, that if you're really drunk you're excluded, you know. So uh, in those days you didn't they kind of qualify to be included. And, uh, and, and uh, Kerouac, everybody expected him to be on the same side, everybody expected him to be friends, right? And uh, Ruben was loving Kerouac and a lot of stuff, and, and Kerouac said, I, I, I'm for war, right? I hate hippies, right? <laughs> and, you know, basically said, I think you should all be rounded up, right? And, and uh, the, everybody was shocked. I mean, the whole of America was shocked. Jerry Ruben was shocked because they didn't expect that answer. And uh, the presenter, who was a really good presenter, he really drove people mad, this presenter. I watched him quite a few times and he asked great questions. And uh, he said, Well, what do you believe in, right? What do you believe in? And Kerouac said, why I believe in tenderness, order, and piety, <laughs> and, uh, and what a wonderful thing to believe in. And I think if you're a passionate uh, artist who speaks the truth from your own heart, you have to have enemies. If you don't have enemies, you know something going on. Uh, so this is called tenderness, order, and piety, and we've hacked into each other's work to make this. At yeah. Rob's suggestion, for the first time, while reading his friend's best-selling novel. The experimental poet, lying in his single bed, came across a true and comprehensive description of himself in print. A mirrored image, leaving nothing out of the picture. It was exactly as he would have expected. During the doubly trying period when they were both poor and obscure, the poet and his friend, in the midst of long and roving discussions of their literary heroes, had often passionately agreed on the need to be absolutely honest about everything in your work, if not, of course, in your life. <laughs> in particular, they had agreed about the need to be searingly and unwaveringly honest and accurate about those people closest to them, out of love of the unrepressed truth, you understand, not malice. When he had finished for a third time reading over the pages, so accurately and implacably describing himself, the experimental poet closed the book and put it down on the bedside table, taking care not to disturb the overflowing ashtray. He got out of bed, stretched and yawned, then crossed eight feet of bedsit to the sink. There, he bent over and gulped down dirty water straight from the faucet. He saw how he had covered the damp, pale walls above the sink with biro-scrawled epigrams and aphorisms from his own darkly insightful brain alongside the writers that he liked. He vomited. <laughs> Later that morning, he took a tip from the radical traditionalist Yukio Mishima and disemboweled himself. <laughs> I was 17 and I was dancing, surrounded by wolves. The place was meant to have been an apartment, but it was unpainted, unplumbed, and unfurnished, save the few crates we had robbed from the dairy for seats and a table to plant the stereo. Our sanctuary. All we did there was an offering to the God of a crazed dance, the God of our undeniable bodies, the God of a fast forwarding doom that fulfilled a sacred promise of escape. The worlds we were trying to leave kept returning. The worlds we were trying to escape kept gleaming through. In songs and in stories, in gestures and glances, in flourishing cracks. Ruins from birth flaunted despite their abandonment. The jackdaws we tried to answer but couldn't. An acquaintance whom I encounter too often, and whom I suspect is ill willed towards me, and was seeking to disturb me and belittle me in the presence of other professional colleagues who were there, told me in front of them that I have at least eight distinct personalities. 
that I am like eight brothers in one man. I had to agree with her on this point, which is news to me, least of all. But I also know that these eight are themselves split eight times each, warringly, and that it is like that all the way down to silence. <laughs> Twenty years later, crying for relief, that emergency beatnik in my mind, observing tenderness, order, and piety. Through all the zigzags and clambering, and even while falling, and even without knowing if the tumbling down would ever stop. Forward, backward to an unhappy beginning, swatting flies with a red wedding ring hand that expressed an outlying truth. My uncle Phil was always groggy with drink in the morning. One night, while he snored and blustered, I shat in his slippers <laughs> and put them back right beside his bed, where he always stepped into them first thing. Shines a light into the darkest corners around these cities, through the towns, up the mountains and on down the rivers, and always that bit of hope we crave. Manage the fantasy, she said. They find you adequate for now. We were close and getting closer. She told me this, but not in so many words. We listened to the wind. These are the preconditions for eternity. Abandoned on these summits so high, only the highest of the gods can spy on us or understand our intentions. The rooted and the rain down upon cannot even imagine us. We are capable of the greatest prizes, the newest crimes. The bed was not large and the heat of her body triggered memories of his half-sister. Proudly pointing at graffiti that read, Janice Wilder is a cunt in dripping red lipstick. These peripheral zones, out past the noise, out past the center, they were all I could fucking afford. The bedrooms of asthmatic children, streets of Limerick, hotel empty, spinning in the mist. Who knows, we may end up devouring each other. Extinction begins with a name, I muttered. Natasha! Natasha! She had been gone two months. The stampede of her death, all that well primed hate of crushed inhabitants, abscond, abyss, absence, an issueless identity of the industrial state at a table in a windowless room, white piles that contain nothing but the whole eternity of self slaughter, townlands. Suburbs, exurbs, fat blocks, and long deserted villages. But where are the clamoring harbors, the magnificent ships, the new continents? There is no precondition for eternity. Three junkies were jousting on Talbot Street. It was two against one, as far as I could make out. A tall, podgy gentleman and a tall, extremely thin lady, both in their forties, versus a much smaller, much slighter gentleman, maybe ten years younger than they were. Can you guess what they were arguing about? I'll give you a clue. It's the only complete sentence I managed the overhearing of as I was passing by. The sentence uttered by the slighter gentleman, who seemed to be on the defensive, to be the most under threat in the situation was, I swear on my little baby's grave. Perhaps a writer is just someone who tries to mirror the whole of the world he encounters and not self-destruct. Cheers. Thank you.